Hey everyone, I'm Scott Stokely and I am here with the top MP40 player in the state of Arizona, I believe, uh, one of the top uh, MP40 players in the world actually, Pete Ulibarri. Now, you might recognize that name, it's pretty famous in disc golf. I'm of course talking about Pete May, multiple time legends champion. You guys share the same thing. Yeah, so, yeah. When people hear Pete Ulibarri, they, they go, oh. They naturally think Pete like, Pong. Like Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're going to be talking about wind today. And this is going to be a little different than most of the wind videos that, uh, that I've done or that are out there. Because here's the thing about wind. It's really hard to teach. If you ask any top player you know, who knows how to play the wind, if you have a nine mile an hour right to left wind and you throw a speed seven disc with a, a number four fade and it's 300 feet and you got to put six degrees angle on it, how many degrees to the right should you throw? Like nobody has an answer. It's hard to quantify wind. They all would have the same answer, which is you throw it about over there, right? It's, it's feel mm -hmm. and feel comes with experience. And, and the good news is everybody with time gains experience. But there's some problems in playing the wind, which is where we're gonna to get to. We're gonna get really high level here. I know a lot of videos that can be very basic. Um, this is not basic. This is gonna be, we're gonna nerd out here. Because the problem with the wind is, if you had a steady seven mile an hour wind, same direction, consistent airflow, most players can get pretty darn good at playing that. However, wind is unpredictable. Even though you know what to do in the wind, well, we're gonna to get to why it might not be as unpredictable as we think. Even if you know how to play that wind, what you typically don't know is, is it about to gust? Is it about to stop? Is it gonna start swirling? And if so, when's it gonna stop swirling? It's blowing this direction on the fair, uh, the tee pad, but wh what direction is it blowing on the fairway? I can see the branches moving, but does that tell me everything? And then of course there's the apparent randomness to thermals, which is the things that make your disc tower or drop for no reason. And you go, wait a second, I threw that perfectly. I had no way of knowing that that was gonna happen. And uh, I was shocked. After 44 years of playing, I had a conversation with Pete. We had a training round last week and I, to be honest I got schooled in a way I haven't been schooled in in uh, in a very long time and I learned so much and the first thing I did is I said please let me make a video with you and let you explain to my audience uh, and Pete said yes uh, before we get to it you have your own channel yeah uh, it's Pete Uliberry. Um just my name uh, I haven't put up in about a month and a half two months it's been a busy couple months but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do more on this stuff on wind. That's one of my big passions is explaining this. And then um, just random stuff from airplanes to disc golf to disc golf to disc golf is kind of my, my gig. Yeah, and I'll definitely put a link up here. And you also do private lessons. You do instruction in the Arizona area. Highly recommended if you're in the area or visiting. Uh, message Pete very, just get him in social media, very accessible. Yeah. And he's, like I said, I've learned more about the science of wind as it relates to disc golf. I'm a science nerd, I, don't, I understand what wind is, but as it relates to disc golf, I learned more in this last week than I have in the previous 30 years. That's, that's God's honest truth. So first off, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm God. really excited about this. So first off, when wind is blowing and it's predicted and the news says you have a five mile an hour wind from the Southeast, Let's just call that a baseline. I mean, I don't think yeah. we need to get into the global reasons why this is happening. Correct. That's your baseline to start with. Why does it change? Why does it change from one area to the next? Why does it change over time? All right. Um, so like you said, uh, one of the things that I like to refer to in, in understanding is like, just pull up your weather app. Um, your weather app's gonna tell you what your wind is gonna be for the day. It'll predict it for the whole day, uh, where we're setting currently here in the southwest is for most of the year we have a southwest wind it blows north northeast and um so during the day like today we moved from like a south wind towards a southwest wind and by the end of the day it's going to move west southwest and so the, day, the through the period of the day it's going to do this so whatever part of the day you're in i call that the truth 
So what you want to do in when, when we're understanding this, we're going to line basically our I ideas of how this works on what is the truth at the moment? What do we know for today at this moment? If it's a southwest wind, anything that deviates from that, any wind change, any headwind change is going to be driven by thermals. So right off the bat, when you're talking about the winds coming from the south to north and then southwest to southeast, west to east, that's more of a gradual shift during the day. Like that's not anything you need to yeah. account for. It's slow. It's slow. We're talking more about the anomalies. Let's talk about the anomalies that happen on the disc golf course. So we're dealing in, in, in a very small patch of the earth on a disc golf course. And so we need to understand what a thermal is to start off with. So the, the main thing about this understanding of everything we're gonna talk about today has to do with thermal activity. And so if we have our ground, our ground level, and you have things like the side of a hill, a building, um, you have grass, you have dirt. You know, if you have a patch of grass, this big area of grass, the grass is going to absorb sunlight. So you have your big sun up here, shining rays down at you. And there are different parts of the ground that are gonna heat up faster than others. So what happens if you have a grass patch over here, but then right over here, you have a, you know, a piece of field that is just dirt. The dirt is gonna absorb the heat from the sun and then begin to give that off. And so as it gives off heat, the air begins to rise from that section. So, you know, another another trigger point would be a big parking lot, right? Parking lots, um, asphalt, concrete, they absorb a lot of heat and then they also release a ton of heat. And so within that realm is what we're gonna look at different patches on, like in your area, your particular course is gonna have a certain weather dynamic that's gonna happen throughout each day. And if you have somebody that is kind of like a course pro, they might have kind of a, a key of what typically happens during the day. And what you're gonna to wanna to understand is that what a thermal is. Now, as, let's, let's, let's look at it from this, this perspective. Thanks, Scott. If we have our ground level here, as the air heats up, as the air heats up, it's going to start warm air is going to start filling into a certain spot. So if we have wind blowing this way, we're going to talk about our prevailing wind for our day. Let's just say south. Um, as the ground heats up, this is going to be a column of air that begins to heat up, say, over a building. And that column of air isn't going to stay in place. So air is going to be drawn towards the thermals. Correct. So what I've always thought when the wind was hitting my back was that the wind was blowing at me. I never thought about that the wind was being sucked, creating the illusion of being blown at me. Is that correct? Yes. So let's look at it from a top down now. So this is a side, a side view. As, as the ground heats up, the air begins to rise. And as the air begins to rise, it can pick, you'll see it pick up dust particles. You'll see it pick up leaves sometimes. Um, let's put ourselves looking down, okay? So if this is this area here, we're looking down at it. Now, as the hot air begins to rise, it's going to displace air from above it. It has to displace air from above it. Um, so as the air begins to go upwards, it begins pulling air inwards towards itself. So as it begins to pull air in towards itself, it's going to be, it's kind of like having a shot back move along the ground. If you've ever used a shot back or like a vacuum and you're cleaning up dirt in your house, you've got your big pile of dirt. And as you bring that vacuum to it, dust particles from all around it begin getting pulled into that vacuum. And it doesn't matter if you're moving the vacuum this way or just go straight down, air gets pulled into it, all right? So let's call this like our shot back. It tends to want to vacuum air into itself. So how large typically are the thermals. I mean, if, if this was a tea pad and this is a hole, is this the scale of a typical thermal size? Are they larger than a hole? Are they smaller than a bread box? <laughs> or <laughs> They give away uh, PhDs <laughs> after many years of school on this stuff. So, so they vary in size based on the day, based on the time of day. So early mornings, you may find just smallest, you'll throw your Frisbee out there and it'll, it'll do a little bit of rising. 
by the time you get to mid morning, 10, 11 o'clock, the thermals, the air is starting to gather itself together, starting to make more, the ground is getting hotter. The, the uh, air is going to start building itself into columns of, of, uh, of air rising. And so they're gonna be bigger. Um, by the time you get to two to three o'clock, you're gonna have these very distinct large thermals. And some of them will be as big as the uh, half acre field, or maybe they'll be as big as the city. You know, like it, it, it all depends. Think of it, think of, uh, Think of like your, 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 your point here. We have a tea pad here and we have our basket over here, okay? All right, so if this right here is a thermal and it, it's, it, it can be as half the size of your fairway. Um, and it can, always, a lot of times the thermal will only affect the, air, the region right next to where you're setting. So if you're throwing a disc here to here and you have this in the middle, knowing that it might be there is really important because um, right here on the tee pad, your apparent wind that you're going to be feeling is a tailwind feeding into that. But halfway down the fairway, this guy, if we had an imaginary guy sitting here, he's not imaginary anymore because we just drew him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's, gonna, he's not going to feel the headwind that, that you feel on the tee pad. He's going to feel a slight tailwind. So the guy standing here is going to make a decision different than the guy standing here based on what they apparently feel and so that's why if we understand that this is dynamic, it's constantly moving. And so it's a hard read to, to begin to learn this, but like, I'm gonna give you tips on how to read this, how to understand it, how to go off what you feel. Yeah, so that, that's what I wanted to ask because if we were in New England in the fall, this is a piece of cake. You would see the leaves painting the thermal. Uh, out of here in, <laughs> on most of the courses here in Arizona, same thing, right? You would see the dust. Yeah, that's not everywhere. The dust isn't everywhere. Uh, I'd like to use an example of um, this this year, 2021, the World Championships were in Ogden, Utah. And one of the courses was the Fort. And the Fort plays through a huge, I would say it's a huge forest of cottonwood trees. Now cottonwood trees, they're called cottonwood trees because the, the, the seeds that the tree gives off flies on little bits of like cottony type material. And that stuff just floats on the air currents. And so for me, when I got there, um, I just sat back and I went, wow, I get to like observe what the air currents down the whole fairway is doing. Now you're in an under canopy then. So the air is going to act a little bit differently in a canopy. And then, you know, on that course, we went in and out of the forest. There's a few open holes and then you go back into the woods. And so being able to read what the, what the um, air was doing using stuff like, like the cotton, that's a very good, a very good um, local thing to know. Okay, so yeah, and, and, I, and I, so I get that. That was an environment where mm -hmm. that works. And next year when I tour, I'm going to have a team of people in every fairway before I throw toss, toss <laughs> drafts into the air for me because I'm a professional. But what about those players with, without a team of grass throwers? How do you judge whether there's a thermal when there's no visible indication? Okay. Um, not to... Uh... Let me see. Let me, let me think this is the right way. <laughs> I'll try and not tell a joke. <laughs> All right. No, so I have hairs on my arm. Mm -hmm. Most people, unless you have alopecia, um, have hairs on their arm. They have hair on their neck. And so what I'll use is basically my main guide is when I'm standing on a tee, I've learned to feel what the air is doing. So there's times you're standing on the tee and it's really warm. Let's just say we have an apparent wind of like five miles an hour. And it's supposed to be a tailwind south. Our, our fairway is lined up north to south. And I know it's supposed to be a tailwind. I can feel the air moving across my body. That I have these, these ways that we can just go, yeah, it's going that way, right? You can turn your face into the wind. Um, now, from that moment, I can feel whether the air shifts to the right or to the left. And I can also feel if the wind shifts into my face. Now, if the wind shifts to the right, it's not that now all of a sudden the entire field has a left to right wind. What it has is we have an anomaly over here where air is beginning to get pulled this direction. And probably for the first 150 feet, you're gonna feel air pulled to this direction. If you feel a really strong pull, and it might even be a pull bigger than like the apparent wind, then we know we have a large thermal off this direction. The air is going up fast and it's going to be pulling half of our fairway. Is any wind that blows a direction other than the way the wind predominantly blows an indication it's caused by something? 
Yeah. Okay. And if it blows harder than it's supposed to, even in the direction you want or slower, it's caused by something. Correct. So without these, without thermals, wind is steady. Wind would be static. So like you've, you've stood on the beach and you've felt the air coming in and it's just this constant steady breeze on the beach typically. You rarely have like the crazy gusting wind. Um, that goes to, to explain one other thing is what drives the wind on the beach because like we have courses that are near like Morley Field, right? Morley Field has tons of swirling winds. Swirly Field. Swirly Field. Why is it Swirly Field? That's a really good question, right? Like it's it's up off the, how high would you say it is off the ocean? A couple hundred feet? Yeah. A couple hundred feet up in the hills. It's, it's, it's kind of like this, this valley feeds up into it. And then um, during the day, so let, let's let's tear this up. I want to I I kind of explain this. This will help understand. Like, it's, a, it's a very good question. That's, that course is played by how many times a year do you think that that's played, Scott? Uh, it's the most played course in the world. Five hundred yeah. rounds a day, so hundred fifty thousand. All right, let's just go like this. Ocean. As the air, as the ground heats up in the morning, sun rises, you know, over over California sunlight is going to shine on here and as this begins to heat up the air over the land begins to rise and as the air begins to rise it starts pulling in the cooler air over the ocean there's cool humid air over the ocean and so that air is going to begin to go like this right it's going to begin to be pulled in and that's why you typically have a wind on the beach is because the air over the land is rising it's getting warm and then it's pulling air in and so as it runs up up here towards where where swirly is the air is beginning to run up this valley and now you have this wind that's blowing up and not only is it blowing inland it's also coming over large trees and so as let's go like this we have a large tree right i know you don't have like the large pines there in morley but as the air flows and it hits this tree the air's not going to go directly through the tree it's going to take the path of the least resistance and so the air is going to want to like run up over the top of it and there's a lot of areas in morley where you have large trees, the air runs and falls. Uh, I think a good visualization would be to think about if you're looking at a river or a creek just, and, and you're seeing the water flow, it's clear, and you're seeing the water flow, the water is going to find the path of least resistance and the air does a very similar thing. It's going to go over the ground and if it runs, counters a tree, it's not going to go through the tree, it's going to go up and over the tree. And so you're going to get like this pressure, this lower pressure above it where the air is going to flow over it. In the water, in, the, in water, you're going to see the, the water is going to be flowing and it'll come to a rock and it'll go over it if the pressure is enough there. And you'll, on the surface of the water, you're going to see this little bubble, right? And, and so if we think about as the air is flowing up that valley over Morley, you've got big cottonwood trees, you've got big, not cottonwood, the, 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 the eucalyptus trees, and the, the wind goes over those trees. And as it gets over to the backside of the tree, let's go like this. As the air gets over the back side of the tree, it's going to go down. And so as the air begins to travel downwards, if you're standing right here, our invisible guy now becomes visible, as the air becomes over, it's going to start dropping down. And if you're putting right here on the back side of the tailwind, not only are you going to encounter the sink from the tailwind, but you're also going to encounter the air just falling downwards over the tree. So Morley Field, basically, it's, it's, it's got a lot of anomalies because not only has it got inland flow near the coast, but it's got all these different trees. It's got this valley that the, the, the air runs up, and so it's running up near that golf course. Air is getting hot on the golf course. It's getting cool over, like, in the shade. And so you have this air that's just constantly roiling over that area to cause a lot of these anomalies. Okay, so the making an estimate of thermals and knowing what they do allows you to predict which way the wind could be blowing. Because even in the middle of the fairway, if there's a thermal in the middle of the fairway, when I'm looking at it, if I've correctly guessed that that's where the thermal is, I have a right to left wind on the right side, I have a left to right wind on the left side relative to airspeed. So if there's a 10 mile an hour wind blowing right to left, but there's a thermal pulling the wind five miles an hour left to right, it's still a five mile an hour right to left. It's gonna, uh, it, it's relative. It's relative. And then 15 miles an hour right to left. So even though the wind might be blowing right to left on both sides of the thermal, it's a 15 mile an hour versus a five mile an hour 
wind just 50 feet apart from each other sometimes. It can be, yeah. So there's, there's times that... Um, you make me want to quit disc golf. This sounds too hard. It's really hard. <laughs> but but the, the, the main thing we want to understand is like what, well, what's driving it? What drives these, these winds? Because um, you've thrown a million shots where you know you've gotten everything that you could possibly get out of that disc. You hit it perfectly, and then that disc just goes out and kind of, pardon the use of my name in vain, but it peters out, right? right. <laughs> it just falls out of the sky, and you're like, whoa, I, I know I threw that well. Maybe I'm just getting old. Maybe I'm getting tired, you know? And then there's times that you've thrown a disc, and you're like, boy, I didn't get all that, and that thing just sails, and it just keeps going, and you're like, wow, I must be younger. I must be awesome. And if I've been able to like sit on a tee pad and watch as players throw, and so it's always good to be first on the tee pad because that means you're scoring well. But sometimes I like to be second to start off mm -hmm. with because they get me a, a wind read, and you know we call them the wind dummy. But the problem is, right. is, I'm, is is I'm less of a dummy than most on the tee pad. And so I have a pretty good guess of what, me, what might be going on. And there's a lot of guys that know that like they want to follow me on the tee pad because I'm going to probably give them a good read. Right. Well, and we talked about this earlier. Uh, when you're competing, the number on the scorecard means nothing. It's the number on your scorecard relative to the competition. So if you guess wrong 50% of the time on what the wind's doing downfield, if your competition is guessing wrong 70% of the time, just because you're wrong half the time doesn't mean you don't have an advantage. You have a massive yeah. advantage because you're getting right relative to the field more frequently. Yeah. So it's not a matter of perfection. It's just a matter of making better estimates then. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Hey, everyone. So I chopped up this long video into smaller pieces to make it easier to download, but you can watch part two right there.